Welcome, everyone. If you could all settle down now, please. Um, we're going to try our best to keep to time today. Um, first of all, kid Mila Mila Falsha to everyone here. That's 100,000 welcomes to Ireland. It, it took us a while to get you, Patty, here, but you're here. Um, and I was thinking this morning, you know, I've met so many great friends in you, Patty, who, who I work with, and here they're from France or Belgium or Italy, and they all have a slight Irish twang in their accent. And when I talk to them, I realize, oh, I used to live in Dublin. So, so, so when we suggested we have our spring conference in Dublin, a lot of the UPATI team were very happy to come back here. Um, and and it's, great, it's great to know that you cherish our city as much as we do. And I hope you all get a chance to get out there um, and see it. You're right in the city centre at the moment. You're, you're right in the heart of history in Dublin Castle. Some very interesting things went down in this place um, over the years. Um, this was the home of, of the British Civil Service um, pre-independence. Um, and, and it's been the home to many things since then. Um, and there's a lot of history in this area. We've got Trinity College down the road, not far, two minutes. So I'd really encourage you to get out there and, and enjoy our city. We, we've we've organised the weather for you as well, and, and uh, we want to thank everyone for that. But I'm not I'm not going to carry on because I do I'm, I'm conscious of time. But it would be wrong of me not to thank our Minister for Health for providing this beautiful venue for us today. Um, he really would like to be here. Um, his name is Minister Leo Varadkar, um, and he, he can't, unfortunately, but he did wish you all very well, and he sent one of his uh, very uh, key people along um, to welcome you here today, and that's uh, Mr. Graham Love, Dr. Graham Love, who's the Chief Executive of our Health Research Board. And I, some of you know, I'm the CEO of IPOSI, which is the Irish platform for patient organisation, science and industry. And we're a real model, apparently, to the rest of you, um, about patient leadership and how patients can lead stakeholders to look at areas around medicines development together. Um, so we've got patient science and industry involved in our, in our, but we get support from Dr. Graham Love's organisation, the Health Research Board, and that's really crucial. It's, it's a partnership with industry and it's a partnership with academics, but it's also a partnership with government um, through the support from, from our Health Research Board. So um, I'd, like to, I'd like to recognise that and, and thank uh, the Health Research Board for that. It's an agency of the Irish Government's Department of Health. They manage an investment portfolio in excess of 100 million, spanning clinical, population and health services research. It also manages key health information systems and provides evidence-based policy support to the Irish Government's Department of Health. Previously, Graham worked in Science Foundation Ireland, covering a variety of areas, including strategy, communications and programmes, where he filled senior roles as Head of Strategy, Director of Policy and Interim Director. Um, so he lives here with his family in Dublin, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Love to the stage now. Thank you very much. I'm just slightly on the way. Uh, remember, you've got a Twitter hashtag on your table, so don't be afraid to tweet today. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. Um, one of the challenges when you hit firmly middle age is that when you go up the steps to the podium, you can hear a creak in your knee. I don't know if any of you picked that up on the way here. Um, it kind of reminds me of when I went to get my uh, haircut last weekend. Um, don't laugh, I do get my haircut. But when people like me go to get my haircut, there are usually three choices. Short, very short, or shaved. And that's what I'm used to being asked the minute I go into a barber. Uh, but it was particularly insulting connecting my latest paranoia about middle age when I went into the barber. Before he asked me anything, he asked me, would I like my ears done? <laughs> anyway, uh, I am a proud Irishman in Dublin, and I thought before I'd kick into the item of pure substance today, I want to do just give five facts about our country and city here that you probably don't know. I'm particularly mindful of the fact that several of the delegates here today flew in either late last night or this morning, and unfortunately will fly out this evening and won't get that much chance to uh, sample our city, our, our, our local wares. So just maybe you might choose to remember one of these on the plane home tonight. Um, Evelyn mentioned the weather earlier. I just do want to remind you that in the summer of 2007, when I brazened it out with my family and said, we're taking a holiday in Ireland this year, we are not going to France or Italy as we usually do, and that summer it rained for 40 days and nights in Ireland. Okay. 
What might surprise you is that more Guinness is drunk in Nigeria than in Ireland each year. It's the second biggest market. That second biggest market. In fact, Ireland is only the third biggest market. Um, uh, the UK is, 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 is bigger than here. Um, the Argentinian Navy was founded by an Irishman by the name of William Brown. There's a um, different fact for you that you'll probably forget on the way home tonight, but you can choose to write that down. Two members of U2, the famous rock band, were not born in Ireland. Did you know that? The Edge was actually born in Wales, and Adam Clayton was born in Shropshire in, in England. Uh, the man who figured out why the sky is blue, the, the mechanism of light diffraction, etc., uh, in the 1860s was actually from County Carlow here in Ireland, a man by the name of John Tyndall, who a famous research institute is named after. And a rather unusual one, if, and this links back to, to you too, um, Bono, the lead singer, was given one of the greatest honours this city can give you, which is the freedom of the city. And one of the unusual rights it affords you is the opportunity to maintain and keep sheep in St. Stephen's Green, one of our premier parks up at the top of Grafton Street. So this is one to keep in mind. Um, okay, to the substance of what we are here today, um, Evelyn has already given you a, a very brief background to the Health Research Board. Um, and I'm going to speak from that perspective here today to the UPATI audience and kind of give the perspective of a funder. I mean, we're a small country. Uh, these are small budgets probably compared to some of our larger brethren, but I think the principles stand the same. Um, we invest about 43 million a year. As Evelyn said, there's a portfolio there of in excess of 100 million right across the health research spectrum. And uh, it's been a challenging few years, as I'm sure you know. I mean, our country's gone through six or seven very tough years, but we are emerging. Um, this year was the first year indeed that our budget maintains stable after seven years of successive cuts. So I think it's a, no a note of optimism that I want to spread in that regard. But let me jump straight to the role of the patient the and the, the public more broadly with the patient uh, as we see it and tell you a little bit about where I suppose our, uh, from our perspective. Um, I'd say we are okay, I'm being very honest here. I do not think we are uh, an exemplar. I think we have a lot yet to do, but we have, we have made some progress. I, I would point to one scheme we've been running since about 2006, which is a partnership we run with a group called the Medical Research Charities Group, which is effectively an umbrella group for the patient groups and medical charities in Ireland. And this scheme was established a little over nine years ago, uh, which allows those charities and patient groups to partner with a state agency like the HRP to fund uh, research projects which are effectively defined by the patient groups and the charity. I think that's important. It, it, is, a, it is a small beacon uh, and there are nice examples of this and the Alpha One Foundation have done it. I've seen it in cystinosis. Probably the one I'd speak most about maybe, maybe the journey travelled by fighting blindness. Um, and it, it in fact started many years ago but this organisation, this set of patients um, really started out a number of years ago, have used a number of vehicles, but in particular this scheme, the Medical Research Charities Group partnership with my agency, uh, to further uh, initially basic research in the areas of uh, the likes of retinitis pigmentosa, which causes blindness, and for example have advanced the technology quite significantly now that they can, um, I won't bore you with all the details, but there is an aberrant protein, um, rhodopsin, in the cones and rod cells in the back of the eye, which effectively misbehaves. And the group, Jane Farrar and Pete Humphreys and others in Trinity, and I see Siobhan um, from Gaynor from Genable here today, they've taken it right up to the point today, um, partly in the co-fund with ourselves and fighting blindness' as own money, to be able to actually dampen down the aberrant protein via uh, messenger RNA interference mechanism and actually encode correct functional rhodopsin. And this is actually going through, I think, functional and toxicological studies at the moment. I think it's due to enter clinical trials testing late next year, as I, as I understand it. And it's a real example of how a patient group and charity can actually define a research agenda and have an avenue to pursue it. So it's quite nice. And you know, I think I, I looked last night at the figures. 90 of these projects have been funded over the last uh, eight or nine years. And it's a, a significant step and not a bad barometer. But it's just one example, and it's in quite a narrow area, I'd have to say. I'm not here to pat myself on the back and, as I said, make ourselves complete exemplars. I think here in Ireland we are learning to walk. We're certainly not running anywhere near it. And I think we have to be very honest with ourselves in that regard. Um, 
if I'm truthful, I would say that that scheme in terms of my agency's spend would be less than 5%. So you might ask, well, that's not exactly a majority of your research spend. How is the public and patient voice influencing that spend more generally? However, I think earlier this year we took uh, a small step towards a more systemic approach. We, would have, we have a scheme called the Health Research Awards. It doesn't really matter what it's called. It is our main staple of project grant funding and sort of definitive intervention and trial funding. It would represent nearly half our spend in many cases each year. And in the call we put out for those, that project funding uh, a few months ago, we actually inserted an entire new section into the specification for the research and in what will be evaluated. And I'm just going to read this out very briefly here. There's a whole section, I even know the number, section 2.5 in the call document, how sad is that? But it says, describe public and patient involvement in your research through the various stages of research, design, conduct, analysis, and dissemination. So this is a specific instruction to the people applying to us for funding in our biggest grant scheme, okay? And again, I'll be very honest with you and say, we have not got this all figured out. I mean, probably the biggest value of this is the signal that it sends. Okay, it's a statement of intent. I don't think we're very clear yet exactly how we'll evaluate this. And this is the debate we had internally in the HRB. Let's figure out all the criteria. Let's put quantitative metrics and everything else. And I said, no, let's get it out there to start with. We will allow our peer reviewers incorporate that into the review process. It's a, an important first step. Um, and per perhaps to provide further uh, proof of that, um, we are developing our own strategy in effect for the next five years and almost at a level higher. It's only a draft plan at the moment. It has to go through the various approval stages, but I do want to call out one particular action that currently is in draft form in that plan, and that states, develop and promote PPI, public and patient involvement, in HRB supported projects and programs. So it's getting elevated to that stage in our strategic plan, which would then should promote the use of our resource and basically put our attention on it to give effect to this. Now that's all great, okay? It's kind of at the level almost of principle or statement of intent. We'll be judged by how good we are at doing it. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and I think this is where it relates specifically to the endeavor that's here today. I pose you as our local instance, but you, Patty, more generally. Um, I, we, the HRB, need help to do this. We're not really clear how to go about it. Obviously, we need a body or a capacity of patient expertise that can be called in and deployed. I mean, I have a vision down the road that the, when the scientific proposals, the clinical proposals are being evaluated, that the level of scrutiny at peer, at our expert academic peer review would be mirrored or reflected by patient and public review, okay? But we're not there. We don't have that skill base yet. But as I understand it, that is what UPATI is about, developing the toolkit, deploying that training, and effectively building a cadre of uh, experts who can participate in that uh, process. And that would be my ambition to build that over our next five years. So I think it's an important first step. And we will be looking to you, Patty, in one, in one respect to help provide us with that. Um, we're particularly interested in some of the outcomes today um, as they move forward. So that's, that's my call to arms, if you like, to actually be able to engage. I mean, like any other state agency, we're busy, we have tight resources. Um, we're not going to be able to create, at this point, something on the scale of Involve across the water in the UK, but I think we can certainly look to see what is already established or being established here today and deploy that in support of that principle I enunciated earlier. And, and um, uh, when Laura, I think it was, and Evelyn asked me to do this opening um, several, a couple of months back, um, I was looking at it. It was around the same time, I have a Twitter feed from Men of History or something like that that uh, sends these sort of inspirational quotes. Um, one arrived around the same time, I thought it was kind of a, 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 a little signal to me to say yes, and I'll close with this comment in, in terms of what is happening here today, and it was from Benjamin Franklin, and it is, paraphrasing it slightly, tell us and we forget, teach us and we remember, involve us and we learn. So at that point, I'd like to declare this conference open and wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much.